Perfect. Well, we're we're right at ten fifteen, so I think I'll I'll kick us off, Amanda and Kate. Um, uh, thank you everyone for coming. My name is Jess Lucero. I'm with the ETE Steering Committee and uh, the chair of the Community Engagement Subcommittee on um, on that uh, larger committee. Uh, Kate Stevens and Amanda Bevington Jungle will be um, uh, uh, facilitating the session this morning with some uh, panel participants as well. Uh, Kate is the Associate Director of the USU Center for Community Engagement, and she oversees campus-based programs and directs the Student Sustainability Office. She led the institution in uh, attaining the prestigious Carnegie Community Engagement Classification, and prior to that role, she served with the Utah Conservation Corps, um, AmeriCorps Program Director for 12 years. Uh, Kate's been a part of national service movement for more than 25 years, serving as an AmeriCorps VISTA leader, Peace Corps volunteer, AmeriCorps program director, and AmeriCorps supervisor. She uh, is the founder of Common Ground Outdoor Adventure, a Cache Valley nonprofit that provides adaptive outdoor rec for people with disabilities. Uh, Kate's received local, regional, and national recognition for her work, in, including underrepresented populations in outdoor leadership and community engagement. Uh, she has a BA in psychology and, and, and sociology and a master's in experiential education. Uh, Amanda Bevington Drungle is leads the community, the efforts of community engaged learning at USU. And this consists of working with faculty to develop course outcomes that focus on community engaged research or teaching that enriches students' learning. Uh, teach civic responsibility and strengthens communities. Um, in addition, Amanda oversees Aggie Pulse, which some of you might know about. It's our community engagement platform at USU, and she advises the community engaged scholars students as well. Amanda has been involved with community engagement on college campuses since she was a freshman in college. She's worked closely with al alternative breaks, campus kitchen projects, uh, and various food security initiatives for over eight years. Amanda has her Bachelor's of Arts in Interpersonal Communication and a Master of Education in Higher Education and Student Development, both from Kent State University in Northeast Ohio. I'll turn the time over to you, Kate and Amanda. All right, thank you, Jess. So um, as Jess um, stated, my name is Kate Stevens and I'm the Associate Director for the Center for Community Engagement here at USU. And today we're gonna, um, discuss best practices in community engaged learning and teaching. Um, a quote that we often um, like to, to bring up is a Confucius quote, I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I understand. Um, are you controlling the slides, Amanda? Proceed. <laughs> All right, so um, Jess Lucero and I, she was actually um, my, my co-leader on attaining the Carnegie Community Engagement Classification for the institution. Um, and so I wanted to first bring this group up to speed on what that is, what it's all about. Um, so it's an extremely prestigious elective classification for institutions who are leading the nation in community engagement. Um, it's a big deal and a, a long process, a multi-year um, process that enabled USU to take very significant steps towards greater institutionalization of community engagement. Um, and this has a direct impact on, on faculty. And, and I'm excited to have Jess um, share with us more about that in a little bit. Um, so USU received this classification in 2020. And um, some of the, the highlights in terms of um, the significant steps that were taken as part of this process were um, that community engagement language now appears in faculty role statements, in our mission interpretation, um, digital measures, and also university awards, so presidential awards for community engagement. Um, in addition, departments as well as individual courses can now be designated as community engaged. And what this signifies is that um, they meet specific criteria for ethical, high quality engagement with the community. Click. <laughs> 
All right. So, so what is community engaged learning? I think um, a lot of you might be familiar with service learning, um, which is what community engaged learning was formerly referred to as. Um, and CEL is, is just a more updated term that, um, that really captures um, reciprocity and working together with community partners to solve um, critical issues that are identified by the community. Um, service, when people hear service, it's often unidirectional, um, the university serving the community. And so through community engaged learning, we're emphasizing the partnership. Um, so it combines academic coursework with institutional resources to address challenges facing the community. And this is done through um, engagement that addresses societal needs, um, again, identified by the community. That's something that's, that's emphasized. Um, community engagement is not based solely on faculty or student interest, um, but rather, um, again, addressing those needs that the community partner identifies and the university responds to. Um, in addition, community engaged learning um, involves clearly artic articulated learning objectives or learning outcomes that are co-created with the community partner. Um, and um, community engagement is the means for achieving or accomplishing those um, learning outcomes. Ongoing cr critical reflection is, is a key component of community engaged learning, the what, the so what, the now what. So not simply going out and um, engaging with the community and applying coursework or um, knowledge obtained in the classroom, but then returning back to those learning outcomes and reflecting upon what was learned. And it's through reflection um, that student learning happens and oftentimes critical reflection takes the place of tests or papers, those more traditional ways of, of demonstrating um, knowledge. Um, there are clearly defined benefits for the students, for the community and the faculty, and those are defined in the beginning. Um, a lot of times uh, we encourage our faculty to, to actually develop a scope of work alongside their community partner that outlines expectations and deliverables um, so that all parties involved um, understand what the benefits um, and expectations are. And um, I think it community engaged learning, it just gives students the opportunity to situate themselves within the community and um, from that perspective, critically examine community issues and challenges. So the course components for a community engaged learning class, um, there are four main components. First of all, um, the partnerships are with nonprofits or public schools or a government agency. Um, community engaged learning courses um, do not partner with for-profit businesses, um, but they're working with partners who, um, who are working towards the public good. Um, assignments and projects are integrated and connected to course material and learning objectives, as I mentioned earlier. Um, they're not tack on extra credit, um, but rather they're deeply integrated into, into the course. Um, again, reflection is, is a key component to community engaged learning, um, and that involves structured activity that recounts experience and learning acquired um, when students are engaged in the community. And then finally, assessment and tracking. Um, so Amanda's gonna talk to you more about Aggie Pulse, um, but it's a, a community engagement platform that we use um, to both document um, hours um, given to community engaged work as well as tracking um, impact. All right, so I'll turn it over to Amanda and she'll talk um, about the designation process, Aggie Pulse, and then um, we have our panelists who will share some more. Awesome, thanks Kate. Hi everybody, so a little bit more, um, if 
you know, if you're in a place where you're wanting to develop your course and designate your course as community engaged learning, uh, we have a designation process through ServiceNow and uh, but usually before you even get to the service now component, you've had a conversation with myself, with Kate, or both of us, and you know, your course is in a place where you're ready to submit this. So we really work alongside you, support you, give you feedback, brainstorm with you, and, and collaborate with you on that. But once you're ready to be to designate your course, um, it is a service now process that we just recently launched and it's been going really well. So that's that's exciting. Uh, you could see a photo of what it would look like. It's a screenshot of when I pulled it up on my computer. And you simply just go to the ServiceNow form and it has basic questions. It's, it should only really take five minutes because again, you're at a place where your course is designed and you're ready to fill this out so you understand what the answers to the questions are. So lots of auto-populated things um, for like your, your name and your information. Uh, and then it goes into some yes or no, just details about your course in general and a couple fill in the blanks and you submit it. That course, uh, that ServiceNow form is then routed to me and I approve or can return it for feedback. If I approve it, it is then routed to your department head. Your department head has the ability to then approve it or um, decline it. Uh, usually they approve it. And, and so once it's approved, it goes to the registrar's office and the registrar's office then approves it and applies the designation in banner. So. That means that if your course is designated as CEL within Banner, uh, that's going to show up on student transcripts as CEL designation, which is really important for our community engaged scholar program that Kate um, or that Jess mentioned that I oversee in the introduction. And so all, all of that information, uh, if you are a faculty member who teaches a community engaged learning course, you often get uh, email communication about recruiting students to apply to become community engaged scholars, which is um, in support of our CEL classes, but we don't have a whole lot of time to dive into that today. Uh, but we have lots of information on our website about it. So. It's important for those students. Uh, it also connects you to not only our office, but different partner and network opportunities within the community. And it also um, allows you to be eligible for many grants that we have through our office. So again, our website is really built out and we have just made a lot of changes to our website. So a lot of this information can be found on our website, which we'll share at the end of the presentation, which is where there's an uh, apply to designate your course button there too. So it's a super streamlined, uh, uh, efficient and effective process when you're ready to designate your course as CEO. Let's see. Um, not sure why. There we go. Okay. So assessment and tracking. Kate mentioned Aggie Pulse, and this is our. Um, okay. So there's a question in the chat. How can we receive notification regarding the application periods for the mini grants? Is it just an open app application all year? That's a good question. Um, we do have information on our website, and there are deadlines. And then uh, maybe at the end, Kate, do you want to speak to the mini grants a little bit more? Okay, great. So we'll we'll highlight that a little bit more before we go into our panel. Um, but Aggie Pulse. So Aggie Pulse is our new community engagement platform at uh, Utah State. And Aggie Pulse is great because it brings together our students, our faculty, and our community partners in one place. So we are directing students who want to who want engagement opportunities on campus and in the community to go find the opportunities there. Our community partners and some of our departments like the service center on campus are able to post and create events and opportunities for students to register for right there in Aggie Pulse. So it streamlines a lot of the process for the community partners and our departments on campus who have opportunities. It allows students to track their hours in one place, uh, find opportunities, connect with peers, uh, follow causes that they're passionate about. And then also our faculty who have uh, community engaged learning designated courses are able to have a page within Aggie Pulse where their students are 
everything's linked to Banner from Aggie Pulse. So all students have single sign-on access and our faculty are able to track their student hours that they're required for courses and their experiences right there in their Aggie Pulse page. They're able to uh, link Aggie Pulse to Canvas. There's an like there's a way to integrate the two. Um, and so there's a variety of avenues to go and, and it's our it's a good way for our tracking of hours and the engagement experiences that are happening. Uh, question is, how accessible is Aggie Pulse opportunities for the other campuses? That's a really awesome question. So we just had a meeting yesterday or within the yesterday and last week about Aggie Pulse on USU Eastern. So that's something that we're building out at the Logan campus. We we just launched this in the spring semester. So we're still learning and we're still building the program out and getting traction ourselves and I'm always willing to meet with anybody on other campuses and trying to expand statewide as well and seeing what that could look like. But yeah, so we just started exploring that for the first time within the last couple of weeks. Um, good question. So the other tracking, we do send out surveys to students in, who have participated in community engaged learning courses. Again, we want to know our you know, our learning objectives being met, our students retaining the material, what's the impact that these courses are having on student learning uh, and their experience at USU. So um, uh, it has looked different. Uh, we've made some adjustments to our, our surveys with COVID and obviously a lot of faculty were being innovative and uh, changing things up when they needed to uh, teach online and what could community engaged learning look online. So lots of good things, lots of good progress and innovation happening, but we do have certain tra tra tracking methods in place. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Kate to highlight a little bit about the mini grants and then take us into our faculty panel. Okay, so the question about mini grants, um, was our, is the application open all year? And yes, you can apply at any time. However, we've set deadlines um, so that if you want you know, funding for the upcoming um, semester, then obviously you couldn't request it mid, you'd need to request it prior to that semester versus midstream. Um, so those, those deadlines are just um, so that we can determine um, who's receiving those grants prior to the upcoming semester. But feel free to, to submit at any point in time. All right, so um, our panelists um, today, um, we have, Dave, I'm not sure if David Anderson was able to join us. Is he, is he with us? I'm here. Oh, yay, great, fantastic. Okay, so um, let's see, back to my slides. Sorry, folks. Um, okay, I stopped sharing so we could see like faces. Panelists, okay, okay. If that's, if that's okay. I can't sure. pin it. I don't think I can pin people to the top, but. No, that's that's great. Okay, okay. so our panelists today, um, David Anderson, um, who is a professor in landscape architecture and environmental planning, Katie Brown, um, who is from the Nutrition, Dietetics, and Food Sciences Department, Brianne Litz, who's with Instructional Technology and Learning Sciences, Jess Lucero, who you met um, in the beginning, is a um, social work professor, and then Sonia Manuel DuPont, um, who's with Communicative Disorders and Deaf Education. Um, so yeah, I would like to, to turn the rest of our time over to this group, and we have um, some questions that we'll, we'll put out to you all to dig a little deeper and learn about how um, community engaged learning is applied in the classroom. So my first one is, um, as we stated, structured reflection is an essential element of a community engaged learning course. Um, how do you incorporate reflection into your course? I'm happy to share. Um, within my nutrition and dietetics courses, um, reflection is written reflection is an integral part of their completion of assignments. Um, 
And this also seems to really prime uh, the students for uh, really rich in-person discussions after they've all reflected personally on their experience that as a group, um, we're able to discuss um, reflectively about the experiences they've had. I'll, I'll chime in on this one too, Kate. You know, um, I, the course that I'm thinking of is my community practice course in social work. This is with juniors in the social work program. And these, these juniors are, are taking data that they have uh, both designed a, a, um, a project around in the previous semester and collecting the data and then designing community interventions in collaboration with our community partners. Um, and for, for me and in that course, reflection is really ongoing and like multi-method. So I'm, I'm, we're, we're meeting in small groups. Often students are really actually bogged down in the details and logistics of the intervention itself. Um, but I'm, I'm uh, really conscious of asking and pausing conversation with students and saying, and, and having check-in questions with them. So it's that like verbal reflection. And those conversations, I think, are some of our richest opportunity for reflection and problem solving and course correcting, but also introspection. Um, and then, of course, I, I have written reflection built in through the semester and a final uh, larger reflective piece um, at, at the end of the semester that really asks students to take a look back at where they started at the beginning of the semester and talk about their growth um, as a result of the community engaged project. My only comment, Kate, about reflection is that we need to do better uh, to do implement some of the, the things, explicit things that Jess was just talking about. Our group, our, our students work in teams and we're constantly revising and changing and modifying what we're doing with our, with our clients and uh, constituents, but um, being more direct about you know, asking the students, what are we learning here? What are the takeaways that they can apply then, not just from a design perspective, but from their interaction with, with the public? Um, we need to do better at that. So I appreciate Jess's recommendation. Um, there is a kind of follow-up question for reflection in the chat, but it says, what specific types of questions do you ask to direct the kinds of reflection you get students to do? I guess I'll chime in here. So I, um, I don't know about, I mean, it's uh, the, the thing I have in common with what's already been said is just like, it's, it's happening all the time, right? And I think that um, for me, it's it can it can potentially feel a little bit like micromanaging for the students, and so I think it depends on like how you're structuring those conversations. So I really like this question in particular. Um, I find that students just want a space to share, to be honest, about what's going on, and usually like I, I just make space for them to kind of bring their issues and challenges to the table. So like, what's going well? What, what are you struggling with? So um, I have the privilege of, you know, working with community partners over six, eight, 10 weeks at a time. So we are checking in at least weekly. Um, and, and part of that is, I mean, these real world projects have real world consequences, even if, you know, the students are transient, like I'm not so much. So it's still really important that the students feel as supported as possible. Um, and we have, especially in my face-to-face -face class, I teach this online as well, so it's a little different, but um, we have structured time every week and that kind of maps on to the iterative design processes that we're teaching anyway, so it's not like it feels sort of separate. Um, those are those are kind of my thoughts about how I integrate it into, into my class. Uh, Brianne, I wanna follow up on something you said that I think is so important is you said these are real world projects with real world consequences. And that's kind of the tone that I try and set with my students all through the semester is like, listen, the work that we're doing 
it, it can have an impact and that impact can be positive or negative. And we have to be constantly aware of like our position in the community and our the, the values that Kate mentioned that should guide community engagement, right? Around um, the kind of co-collaboration of that process. Um, I, uh, you know, bring a perspective that's both a nonprofit perspective and a university perspective to this, um, just to, to community engaged teaching. And uh, it is it is so common that we uh, um, I think as as university faculty um, who have a good idea or get maybe a certain idea on a community partner um, and we take off with the semester and our students feel like they're making an impact but in actuality they might be draining resources from your community partner or delivering a product or outcome that actually wasn't needed or wanted. Right. And so those kinds of like value based discussion is also part of the reflective process, I think, for students um, throughout the semester. So thanks for bringing that up, Brianne. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing. I'm going to move on to the next question just for time purposes. Um, the next question is, how have you put community voice at the center of your work and why is that important? For my students um, who are juniors and seniors in communicative disorders, um, a lot of times they get so caught up in learning the technical aspects of the field that they lose sight of what they're going to actually be doing with that information. And so they comment that um, having these different community partners and projects that um, they're working on throughout their coursework really helps them to understand why they're learning what they're learning and why the, the depth of what they're learning is necessary. And they're just excited to be able to actually practice some things that they're learning in class. Um, our degree is a master's degree before you can actually um, become licensed. So that's a long way off for a junior. Um, and this really helps them to understand that um, they have, they can have a huge impact on individuals' lives and with our community partners. So it's really enhanced just the overall um, delivery of the course information in addition to giving students this opportunity to practice. Amanda, the question was, how do we incorporate community voice? Is, is that correct? Yeah, how is it at the center of your work and why Why is that important? It's just like, like Sonia was talking about, it is so critical because you're, you are affecting and impacting uh, real people and their real lives. In the case of what we do in landscape architecture, obviously uh, we're making uh, giving ideas and concepts and suggestions to communities typically and or nonprofits occasionally about what they can do to change their future, to adjust the vision and perspective that they have uh, for their community. And um, it's just really, really important not to kind of, you know, sit on our proverbial ivory tower and, and say, you all should do these things. Uh, we, we have to get into the weeds and try to have some understanding and perspective about who we're serving. Understanding the audience and who the clients are is, is absolutely essential. Um, one way I, I, uh, I, I totally agree, David. And I, you know, one way that I, integrate that voice maybe in like logistically in the classroom is um, by, and, and I try to check with community partner too about like what is their capacity for involvement um, to right because I don't want to expect that a community partner is going to be like right alongside me if every step of the way in the semester they might need just maybe more check-ins with with where we're where we're at with a project but I almost uh, as often as I can, I'll have a panel or a guest lecture from our community partner, a way for students to both like directly connect with 
with the the partner in the classroom and ask questions and and maybe get like some deeper familiarity and build relationship um and and also to hear firsthand from the partner what their needs are right and what they're they're hoping to uh, address together we have um we've just finished uh, what is over a two-year effort with the city of Santa Quin, Utah, which is in the southern end of, the, of Utah County. And um, we, we met uh, during spring semester, we met with the client, and Zoom helps this, right? It's, it's awesome. Uh, we met with the client at least weekly, and we were interfacing. They were, it depends on the client if, or the community partner if they're really engaged as well. But the degree to which they are, we should reciprocate or be more so. And uh, we were able to meet with our, our um, community partners every week. They came here um, and spent several days with us and we've gone there for presentation. And um, <laughs> I'm right in the middle of doing my dossier for promotion. So please forgive me, but I wanted to read just one tiny comment. I The, the city manager wrote us and he said, um, uh, Dave's leadership and guidance provided uh, he provided to the students was invaluable and helped to ensure the end product met the community's needs today and will continue to provide a roadmap for us into the future. That's a uh, representation that we're, we're at least doing something right. Uh, if they're genuinely pleased to be able to say something like that, he's not just blowing smoke. And so uh, that, that iterative repeated consistent message and interaction with the with the um, community partner is is just really really vital um yeah so i'll add maybe a little bit of a different perspective uh just uh since we kind of talked a little bit about teaching and talk a little bit about from a research perspective um so well, I guess stepping back, I think like my question is like how you view your role at the university period. Um, because I think that of like, why is it important? My, my question would be like, why is it not everything that we do? Because um, we as a university, as a land grant university, as you know, having an extension, all these things like inherently that hopefully is a value we all just embody anyways. Um, and so, I think the act of centering it in a system that historically doesn't really center that is, is its own sort of question and, and problem and, and challenge. But um, I think from that stance that community partnerships, like that's why I am a professor that because I get a, I'm in a position where I get to do things to help people in ways that I can't if I'm not a professor. Um, and that's like how I come to the work period. So that I think for me, the um, how do you center the voice? And that's not to say like, oh, I've always done this well and I've never sort of failed at community partnerships or hurt someone at all. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I think that like, um, I just, I don't even know how to do this job without including people um, in the community who this is impacting because uh, we have like the privilege and the power to do that in our positions at Utah State in a way that not everybody does. And I think that's really cool and a huge benefit of like why I keep the job that I have. Um, and so I think one of the most fundamental ways I'm doing this in my research is just completely reimagining how we do research. So it's requiring new research methodologies. Um, one of my projects is with the Northwestern Band, the Shoshone Nation, and we kind of call it like community-driven research. So it really is completely, um, restructuring in a lot of ways the university systems that I'm accountable to, to accommodate the sovereignty and honor the sovereignty of like the tribe that I'm working with, for example. Um, and so it is it is hard work, but I think that, um, I, I, I hope as we kind of move forward, this is sort of just an assumed approach and, and orientation to, to our jobs at, at Utah State. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to move on to the, the next question. I'm seeing the, the time go by so quickly. Um, so Jess, I, I'd kind of like to direct this to you. Can you talk to this group about how USU rewards community engagement in the promotion and tenure process? 
Yeah, I'd be happy to take that. Um, so like Kate mentioned, when we were going through the Carnegie uh, uh, kind of classification self-study year and even leading up to that, this was an area that we identified institutionally as, you know, it, it, community engagement is something that is kind of built in or baked into what USU does through many of its um, initiatives, centers, extension, et cetera. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't like codified. It wasn't in the uh, 405 code. And that was an effort um, by a, a big group of people to get that language into our uh, promotion and tenure uh, code. Um, so now community engagement shows up in, in um, the 405 code around teaching uh, research and service. And so, you know, I, I just want to really highlight that because it, for folks who are doing community engaged work at, across any component of your role statement as a faculty person, um, there are ways for you to um, demonstrate your excellence, right, in doing that work and for that to be a rewarded piece of your like evaluative body of work. Um, it shouldn't be looked at as a, as a side route or something that you do when you have a little spare time, right? It can really be kind of a cohesive part of, of your identity as a scholar at USU. And it's something that is, is recognized and, and celebrated, I think, um, formally through the promotion process. But then I think there are other um, types of awards and recognitions that happen at USU that uh, connect to community engagement, the president's awards, um, the uh, other awards that come out of, of the, the center um, for community engagement as well. Kate, is there anything else you'd want to add to that? I think that um, that's great. And I did also want to bring up the presidential awards that are official USU awards um, for community engagement and make sure that this group was aware um, of that way in which you can recognize your, your colleagues and students um, and partners. Yeah, and I guess I'll add one more thing because of course I'm a little long-winded sometimes. Um, I, you know, the awards in and of themselves or recognition in and of itself is, is you know, that's not where the value is. I think the value is in the signal out to our institution and to our communities that like doing this kind of work to connect what Bri to what Brianne was saying too, like what kind of, of scholars do we want to be? What kind of impact does our institution want to have on our community? When we recognize this work at a, at a higher level, I think it, it does, it signals that the importance of this work. Amanda, do you want to take the next question? Yeah, I am going to also share it in the chat because I feel like it's a little long, but um, how much additional time or energy or effort uh, was required in preparation for your CEL course? How did you navigate this and does it actually take more time? Oh, I'm going to send it in the chat. The answer to that is so, yes. Uh it I'll, takes more time yeah. <laughs> go ahead oh i was just gonna respond because my uh flight might start boarding while we're in the middle of this question but um the uh i would say as compared to what um what are we comparing it to because if we're comparing it to sort of just meeting the bar of having a class that students are engaged in I mean, I don't know, I'm a learning scientist. So this question was really like, I, I kind of got lost in it a little bit of like, well, what is our goal for the class? I think if your goal for the class is to give students real world experiences, connect them with actual humans in the world, have an, a community impact, then like, I don't know that it takes any more I don't actually know, I, I don't know many other ways that you do it without involving the people in the community, at least in a way that honors the goals you're trying to make. Um, I, I think, Sometimes, I mean, it's really easy to get caught up in sort of like content oriented goals. Um, and again, it goes back to kind of my point I was saying earlier of like, well, what is our role as an institution, as professors in the classes that we're teaching? Um, that aside, I like, yeah, David, I think, I, I mean, I agree. It takes more time. I mean, it takes, I don't know that I would say it may, takes more time than my prepping a class in any given semester. It's a different kind of effort, 
Um, I'm dependent on other people. So there's a lot of independence and reciprocity in a way that like, so it's very complex, I feel like. Um, and it's a different kind of hard for that reason. But I don't know if I calculated the raw amount of time re-prepping a class every semester, if it would be that much more work personally. But I teach design classes. And so it's not like I have content that's static ever either. So it could be the nature of, of what I'm teaching. I agree with you um, in that regard, Brienne. I When I said it takes more time, it takes more time to establish main and maintain the relationships with the community partners. They are, as you said before, students are transient. <laughs> you're there or you're in your position for a while. And, uh, and all of us are, and we represent the institution. And so establishing that long, uh, you know, positive relationship with community partners is extremely beneficial, but it takes time and effort uh, to steward that. I would agree with both of you, and I would uh, I would answer the question uh, this way: that it's quality time that you're spending. Um, there, there's a lot of time that you spend on your courses that you'd rather be doing something else uh, because someone has required you to, you know, write up uh, a different description for the 19th time. Um, so this is this is really quality time. You're you're dealing with your students one-on-one. Um, -on -one. You're dealing with your community partners. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's something I really look forward to unlike my weekly or monthly faculty meetings. Uh, so I would rather be spending my time doing this than a lot of administrivia. Sonia and I are soulmates when it comes to that. Huh? I'd add briefly that um, in terms of our nutrition and dietetics program, um, a lot of you know, community engaged pieces are just integral into our program and requirements for accreditation. So in one way I could look at it as it's not more work because we're already doing it. But if I compared it to, you know, say like a, a lecture based uh, course that maybe does have some more static information, I would say that this type of course um, could be more work than than that type of course. All right, I think we might have just a couple more minutes we can squeeze in here. Um, if some of the faculty have just a quick parting advice um, you would have for, for faculty members who may be new to, to this type of teaching. Somebody had written that, that they were new and wondered how to begin to establish relationships and that Again, it takes a lot of time and effort, uh, certainly being genuine and um, trying to assess and, and understand the needs of a, of a particular community partner. Start small, don't overreach, and uh, do something that you can be effective at right out of the gate rather than something you fall short on because the scope is too big. I, I love that advice, David. I think that's really smart around the starting small, re recognizing your capacity. Um, and and also, um, I guess a piece of advice I have is being comfortable with the messiness of community engagement, the unpredictability, the uncertainty, um, and also uh, you know, preparing your students and equipping them with that flexibility as well, because sometimes there, there will be moving targets in a community engaged course or unanticipated challenges. Particularly during COVID, this has been really tough. Um, and uh, my students have been frustrated by um, having to do so much on Zoom um, that when they would have preferred to have been in person uh, and, and had more of a connection. So this, this past um, three semesters have, have been really hard. Um, to really feel like you're making um, a connection. So I think um, the last time we had a panel discussion, I said you need plans A, B, C, and D because A, B, and C are gonna fail for sure. And 
um, you need to just be ready to pivot when you have to pivot, you know, like with the pandemic coming, it's like one minute you're in a school, the next minute you're not, and you have to figure out a way to deal with that and, and to help your students understand that um, better too, because it's disappointing for them when they get in the middle of a project and um, everything changes. Our students tend to be pretty concrete. You know, they, they want to know what to do and how to do it and, you know, one, two, three, four, five. And um, I think it's a good life experience for them to learn that life itself is not that way. So be ready to change when you have to change. Awesome. Well, we appreciate everybody's time and our panelists. You all are awesome. And thank you for, for being here and being able to share um, some of your perspective. And just as we're on the dot with 11 a.m., I just want to highlight that we are the first couple weeks of the semester. Look out to your emails. We are launching a community engaged learning and Carnegie classification um, campaign. It's going to be kicked off by the provost, which is super exciting. And so the initial communication will come from the provost, but uh, from that email, you'll be able to opt into the campaign and you'll be able to follow along uh, learning more about community engaged learning and uh, also Carnegie classification and how you can get involved in, in different resources that are available to you to learn more. So we're really excited about it and we hope that you opt into our campaign. And thank you again for, for to everybody for being here.